What's up, everybody? Welcome back into another video. We're looking at Donna Adelson's case again as she has lost another lawyer, not just Daniel Rasbaum, Mr. Morris, who did an interview on the courthouse steps after the prior pretrial hearing where it was continued because of all the Rasbaum mess, saying he was still going to be on the case. They're going to add lawyers to the case. They're going to push it as hard as they can, as fast as they can. Well, he's out. And we're going to read why. And we're going to talk about what this means and what's next for Donna Adelson. So before we jump into specifically what the court's order is, which we are going to get to, I thought it was, it was important that the court added as exhibits the pretrial hearing transcript without the ex parte in camera uh, discussion with Mr. Morris. But he did put that transcript in here. And he also put the motions that led to all the rigmarole that ended up becoming Daniel Rasbaum's disqualification and removal from the case. I guess it wasn't te technically disqualification. He withdrew from the case and the court accepted his withdrawal. And that was based mostly on Charlie Adelson and his new lawyer, Michael Ufferman, who a lot of you guys know now. And if you don't know, you can go back on our channel and check out the interview I did with Michael Offerman talking about what he does, how these cases are difficult. He doesn't speak at all about anything Charlie told him or about this case uh, because all that's privilege. We don't want to even get close to that line, let alone tow it. Um, but you can get to know what he's about, how smart he is, how good of a job he does with this stuff representing his clients. And his client is number one. Nobody else. His client. So let's read through some of the motions back and forth that happened back on September 16th when that trial was supposed to start. And we'll talk about how the pretrial hearing ended and talk about that interview again a little bit more with Mr. Morris. Then we'll get to the judge's order, which is kind of, it's definitely interesting because it's not what I expected. The state witness, Charles Adelson, noticed that he is invoking his Sixth Amendment right as to his former counsel, Daniel Rasbaum, and he does not waive the conflict of interest regarding his attorney-client communication with Mr. Rasbaum. Mr. Adelson was previously charged in Leon County, first degree M, conspiracy to commit it, solicitation to commit it, the case proceeded to trial and Mr. Adelson was convicted as charged. At trial, Mr. Adelson was represented by Daniel Rashbaum. Mr. Adelson's judgment is not final, and that's really important. His case is currently pending on direct appeal. Mr. Adelson is now represented by undersigned counsel Michael Ufferman and Laura, Laurel Cornell Niles. In the instant case, the state filed an amended answer to demand for discovery on July 11th, 2024. The document listed additional prosecution witnesses, one of whom was Mr. Adelson. I'm sorry, uh, Laurel Cornell Niles, I think is somebody I potentially went to law school with. So I need to, I need to look that up at the end of this video. Maybe we'll, we'll, do, we'll keep the video rolling while we look it up. The document listed additional prosecution witnesses, one of whom was Mr. Adelson, Charles Adelson, CO Daniel Rashbaum. The state has issued a subpoena for trial for Mr. Adelson and Mr. Adelson was transported from prison to Leon County Jail for Friday on Friday, September 13th, 2024. Undersigned counsel Ufferman was able to meet with Mr. Adelson at the jail on Saturday, September 14th, 2024. And we heard about all this in the hearing, but now we're actually reading the motions. The trial in Mr. Adelson's case is scheduled to begin the week of September 16th, sorry, Ms. Adelson's case, 2024. Mr. Rashbaum is one of the defense attorneys who will be representing Mrs. Adelson in her upcoming trial. The Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution states that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to have assistance of counsel for his defense. The essence of the Sixth Amendment right is privacy of communication with counsel. The attorney-client privilege is the oldest of the privileges for confidential communications known to common law. Its purpose, is, its purpose is to encourage full and frank communication between attorneys and their clients, and thereby promote broader public interest in the observance of law and administration of justice. We want you to be open with us as lawyers. That's the only way we can represent you, the only way we can help you, and the only way you can have a level playing field with the state attorney's office. If this stuff can just be broken whenever lawyers want to, whenever when things go south, then nobody would actually be honest with their lawyer. They would get screwed. They would get railroaded, and it would create problems for the public at large and for the country at large. Uh, rule 419 of the rules regulating the Florida Bar entitled a conflict of interest to former client states, a lawyer who has formerly represented a client in a matter must not afterwards, okay, represent another person in the same or substantially related matter in which that person's interests are materially adverse to the interests of the former client unless the former client gives informed consent. So in this situation, it's definitely a person substantially related to the matter, but not at this point, so we thought, materially adverse. 
They also cannot use information relating to the representation to the disadvantage of the former client. And this is where we get into trouble for Mr. Rasbaugh. Except as the rules would permit or require with respect to the client or when the information has become generally known. So if it's known and everybody knows it, it's not exactly protected anymore, not a big deal. Like if Charlie Adelson said something on the record at his former trial, it wouldn't be a big deal if Daniel Rasbaum talked about that with somebody else because it's public record now and he testified before the world. Uh, or C, reveal information relating to the representation except as the rules would permit or require with respect to a client. So again, the rules would permit and, uh, and allow with respect to the client if the client's suing you, if there's certain proceedings where the court can force you to break it or if a court orders you to break, violate attorney-client privilege. We don't have any of that here. So we're really focusing on B, which is use information relating to the representation to disadvantage the former client. So is he going to cross-examine him? Is it going to make him look bad? Is it going to hurt his appeal that right now is happening? If Even if that answer is a maybe, it's out. He's conflicted off. In Coker versus State, an attorney's previous relationship with a client who has become a witness for the government and plans to testify against the attorney's client presents a dilemma of divided loyalty. It would be improper for the attorney to use privileged communications from the former client and cross-examination of that former client, which is exactly what we have here. Uh, the trial court has an interest in conducting a fair trial by ensuring that the defense counsel's cross-examination of his past client, Kruger, does not compromise Kruger's privileged communications. Thus, because Mr. Rashbaum previously represented Mr. Adelson, Mr. Rashbaum currently represents Mrs. Adelson, the state has subpoenaed Mr. Adelson as a witness for Mrs. Adelson's trial, signaling its interest to call Mr. Adelson as a witness during the trial, and four, if Mr. Adelson, meaning Charlie, is called as a witness by the state during Mrs. Adelson's trial, Mr. Adelson will be subject to cross-examination by Mr. Rasbaum, his former attorney. Mr. Adelson files this pleading, formally invoking his Sixth Amendment right as to Mr. Rasbaum, and Mr. Adelson specifically asserts that he does not waive the conflict of interest regarding his attorney-client communication with Mr. Rasbaum. We remember from the hearing, Rasbaum said, yeah, this stuff happened orally, we talked about it, and we also heard and know that he can say, well, now I am invoking it even if I didn't before, but guess what? It wasn't a written waiver before. That's a bad move. That's why Rasbaum ended up just withdrawing. But Morris wanted to stay on. Further, unless there is a finding of the court that Mrs. Adelson's defense team constructed a, an ethical wall, and that's the question we have before us today, with regard to Mr. Rasbaum's knowledge and information gleaned from his prior representation of Mr. Adelson from the initiation of its re representation of Mrs. Adelson in the same or substantially related matter, Mr. Adelson would assert his privilege and the conflict of interest applies to the entire defense team, which would include Mr. Morris in Mr. Mrs. Adelson's case. And Mr. Adelson should not be subject to cross-examination by any member of the defense team who has been tainted by Mr. By Mr. Rasbaum's knowledge and information. So we talked about this a little bit before. But basically, Offerman is saying, not just should Rasbaum be out, which eventually even Rasbaum agreed with, but Morris and everybody else should be out unless they can prove that they built an ethical wall. And judge, if they can't, do we really want to do this all over again? And we know now what we didn't know when Offerman filed this motion that Rasbaum's out. He withdrew. Judge agreed with it. Regardless of what Mrs. Adelson said and all the waivers that she was willing to do. Do we want to have the same exact thing happen on the eve of trial for Donna Adelson a second time with Mr. Morris? That's at least part of what I think the judge is thinking here. But let's read the response now. This is them just showing C. Adelson's a witness for the prosecution, which would mean, again, adverse to Donna Adelson. So here's the defense's response. Trial is presently scheduled for tomorrow. Adelson, through his counsel, filed the motion seeking to preclude former counsel Rasbaum from cross-examining him. At, as this court is aware, undersigned was brought into the instant case in January. While defense counsel believes an ethical wall was created where Morris was not tainted or contaminated, third-party counsel has been secured specifically for the purposes of examining Mr. Adelson should the need arise. So there, this is when they were going to bring in somebody else to cross um, Charlie. Communication with third-party attorney has been restricted to confirming his avail availability and a conflict check. Undersigned counsel has conferred with Ufferman as well as Ms. Koppelman. The aforementioned proposal appears to resolve Mr. Ufferman's concern. Counsel does not believe Ms. Kappelman has an objection uh, to the proposed remedy. But then Ufferman comes back. In Ms. Adelson's response, this is, Adel this is Ufferman now responding back. Defense counsel for Mrs. Adelson suggests the possibility of using third-party counsel to cross-examine Mr. Adelson. However, so up here it's like, it seems like Ufferman's good. It seems like we've resolved Ufferman's concern. However, in Colker again, it says the petitioner has argued that any actual or potential conflict could be avoided by having substitute counsel conduct the cross-examination of Marx's former client. We disagree, the court said in Coker. 
So they tried this. Court disagreed. The conflict arises from the past relationship and cannot be avoided by sectioning off portions of the trial. Such an unwieldy procedure could only further cloud the glass. The potential for conflict would remain, as would the appearance of impropriety. Courts have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted within the ethical standards of the profession and that legal proceeding, uh, proceedings appear fair to all who observe them. Wherefore, Adelson prays this court will protect his Sixth Amendment right. So Ufferman actually did not agree with that substitute counsel coming in and asking those questions. And then this is just a subpoena for uh, Charlie Adelson. So he was, in fact, going to be potentially called by the state. So that substitute counsel at the time to do cross-examination was not okay with uh, Charlie Adelson or Michael Ufferman. They continued to object was an ethical wall built because they said, we've got a problem with the ethical wall. Uh, we need to make sure that ethical wall is correct or Morris is going to be um, struck. They did this on the eve of Don Adelson's first trial. If Charlie Adelson is called as a witness again and Robert Morris, is, Robert Morris, um, Alex Morris, I think, uh, is the attorney for Donald Adelson, you might could expect a very similar motion filed by Offerman on behalf of Charlie Adelson. But the judge did the in-camera proceeding with Morris, I think maybe with Rashbaum as well, to see if the ethical wall was built appropriately. And it so seemed at that time that it was. And Morris was going to be allowed to continue on this case. Morris walked out to the courthouse steps, said he was going to fight for Don Adelson, made it seem like maybe it's going to be better that Rashbaum is gone. Maybe it opens up some arguments they weren't going to previously have, but that they were definitely going to add to this team. Well, let's see what the judge has to say. Order disqualifying defense counsel. Spoiler alert. The cause came before the court on its own motion. The court, having considered the record developed on September 17th, which we just talked about, including the positions of each party, the relevant legal authority, and otherwise being fully advised, finds as follows. The withdrawal of attorney Daniel Rashbaum became necessary when he engaged in a conflicted representation falling short of the ethical obligations for members of the Florida Bar. That's not great, right? That seems like a shot taken at Rashbaum that he violated the ethics of the Florida Bar. So will there be more to come with that? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But he didn't necessarily have to put that in there, meaning the judge, and he did. Upon further consideration of the September 17, 2024 record, he could have just said Rashbaum uh, withdrew before any decisions were made. Upon further consideration of September 17, 2024, oh, it is Robert Morris. Just kidding. Sorry, I thought it was Alex Morris. Um, record and in the in-camera proceedings with attorneys Daniel Rashbaum and Robert Morris, a sufficient ethical wall was not established. So Rashbaum and Morris talked to the judge trying to explain how there was an ethical wall, but it failed. And let's go to the footnote here. On September 17th, this court pronounced that the defendant could work with Robert Morris in choosing to hire additional counsel or resetting the trial date as her motion for clarification identifies. However, as this court explains, a review of the written transcript of the proceedings and the relevant case law has convinced Vince this court that disqualification of Robert Morris and Adam Commissar are required. Wow. So the judge said at the time, I thought this was okay. After the hearing that we had together, I thought this was okay. But now, after looking again, I do not think this is okay. So what changed is the big question. What changed from September 17th to today? That is an interesting question for the court. Thus, the conflict of interest involving privileged information or communications has been imputed to Robert Morris. Additionally, this case is rife with the potential 
for the same conflicts as to Adam Commissar. Unimputing a conflict seems in, as implausible as unringing a bell, unscrambling an omelet, or pushing the toothpaste back into the tube. I know you guys love those kinds of analogies. So what the court is saying is, listen, this is dirty. We feel and we've heard the, the principle, the legal principle of fruit of the poisonous tree. Whatever grows from that tree, whatever touches it is poisoned. They can't use that evidence. And it seems to me, as I read this motion or this order, the judge is basically saying this all stinks. And while we have the delay, while we've already tossed the trial date that everybody was ready for, we might as well make sure we get it right. Why take the chance? Why have the appearance of impropriety? Let's cut the, if the whole arm is infected or just the hands infected and it can go up, cut off the arm. And that's what it seems like the judge is doing here. We don't want to take any chances. We don't want this to all explode on our next trial date. So let's just do it now. And what's that mean? What's going to happen? The number one thing for Don Adelson, I expect a major delay. This trial moved pretty quickly. Seemed like it was ready for trial. Made sense with Rashbaum. He already knew everything. To have somebody completely unconnected with the case, completely knowing nothing about the case, stepping into this whirlwind. Now, they can do it. Lawyers can do it. Especially defense lawyers, especially good defense lawyers. They can do it. But it is definitely going to take more time. And while I think the judge is trying to eliminate as many appellate issues as possible, will this become an appellate issue? The answer is probably not. But the only real way to make it like 99% not a good appellate issue for the defense is to give whoever the new defense attorney is absolutely as much time as they ask for. You can't push them at this point. If they tell the judge, I need a year, you pretty much have to give them a year. The judge says, no, you got three months. Like you threw all these lawyers off the case, judge. Some of them may be questionably conflicted, like even Adam Commissar. So you got to give them time. And I think the judge will give them time. I don't know. Maybe they'll be able to get ready in three, four, five, six months. I don't know. But whatever time the defense attorney asks for, I expect the judge should give it. Will he give it? I don't know. Uh, Florida rules regulating the Florida Bar 435 and 484 impose on all Florida attorneys an ethical responsibility to refrain from engaging in conduct intended to disrupt a tribunal and conduct which is prejudicial to the administration of justice. While the defendant remains a presumptive right, under the Sixth Amendment, to her counsel of choice, that right is not absolute. The presumptive right under the Sixth Amendment to counsel of choice cannot interfere with the fair and orderly administration of justice or the court's authority to monitor and control the pace of litigation. Both federal and state courts have repeatedly made clear that the right to counsel cannot be manipulated so as to obstruct the order, orderly procedure in the courts or to interfere with the fair administration of justice. I don't know if he's saying any of this done was, was done intentionally. I don't think it was. But he is saying, like, you can't trample on Charlie Adelson's rights in the name of Don Adelson's rights. And we have these rules. And if there are conflicts and it's going to be appellate issues, we really can't do this. Let's just not do it. Pick a different lawyer. There's plenty of, there's a hundred thousand lawyers in Florida. Uh, Florida Supreme Court holding that there is no absolute right to a particular counsel where there is a countervailing public interest in the fair and orderly administration of justice. The fair and orderly administration of justice cannot be maintained when conflicted counsel or counsel with the potential of conflict cannot meet the standard of serving as constitutionally effective counsel. Explaining that trial courts have institutional interest in protecting the truth-seeking function of the proceedings over which they preside by considering whether the defendant has effective assistance of counsel regardless of any proffered waiver. Furthermore, the danger to conflict-free proceeding was not cured by Daniel Rashbaum's withdrawal. Prior to the selection of the jury, Charlie Adelson filed a notice indicating his non-waiver of any conflict of interest with D Daniel Rashbaum. Robert Morris then filed a response in which he advised that third-party counsel had been retained to resolve any actual or potential conflict of interest. In the reply, Charlie Adelson objected to Morris or a third-party counsel cross-examining him. And that's why we just read it again, or for the first time on this channel, but that's why we reviewed it. The Third District Court of Appeal, when reviewing the disqualification in, of counsel in Colker, you know it's always good when the, law, when the judge is citing the case that you cited, points for Michael Ufferman, disagreed with the proposition that an actual or potential conflict could be avoided by having substitute counsel cro uh, conduct the cross-examination of a former client. The Colker Court further explained the conflict arises from the past relationship and cannot be avoided by sectioning off portions of the trial. The potential for conflict would remain, as would the appearance of impropriety. 
absent judicial intervention at this point, delay to the fair and orderly administration of justice will be at risk of repeating itself. So he's saying we could have this happen all over again. We could have Offerman file another good motion, strike Morris, and then we have another delay. Let's just forget it. Let's get rid of all the even potentially conflicted counsel, the conflict that would even uh, promote an appearance of impropriety. Let's get rid of all of them. He is basically, which is again, another reason why I want to read Offerman's motions again, he basically pulls exactly the arguments Offerman made on behalf of Charlie Adelson and is getting rid of all of Donna Adelson's lawyers. Charlie Adelson and his lawyer are looking out for Charlie Adelson and his lawyer, and I'm not going to fault them for that. But this can't be good for Don Adelson. You've built a rapport. You have these lawyers you trust. You got your theory together. And now you got to start from square one with a new lawyer. Build a new rapport. Do you trust them? How do you find them? Frankly, because they're disqualified and conflicted off, she is not technically supposed to get a referral even from Daniel Rashbaum or Mr. Morris. When you're conflicted off a case, you are not supposed to refer a client to your buddy or somebody else you work with, a la Alex Murdoch. We know he liked to do that. Without the establishment of a sufficient ethical wall, which is very strange because at the time it felt like the judge thought there was an ethical wall and now he doesn't, and that's the factual issue I wish I knew. What changed his mind? Because legally nothing changed. Maybe he just thought the bar got higher once he read some case law for an ethical wall and where he thought it was lower, the ethical wall cleared, but it didn't clear that higher bar. That's all I can think of. And the fact that even third-party counsel cannot avoid the potential for conflict, the court cannot permit Robert Morris or Adam Kosmar to remain as counsel of record, nor will the court permit this untenable situation to continue. Accordingly, for the above reasons, attorneys Robert Morris and Adam Kosmar are disqualified from further representation of the defendant. The case management scheduled on October 15th is hereby canceled and reset to December 10th, two-month delay just for the case management or, or conference because that's when we're actually going to pick a trial date and pick all the new dates. Will new counsel want to do more depositions? Will they have any experts they want to hire? It's their prerogative as the new defense counsel. Two-month delay just in a simple case management conference. Conflict-free counsel for the defendant is to file a notice of appearance in the interim period. Any transfer of the physical file, discovery depositions by prior counsel is to be done without annotation or oral communication that would create another imputation of conflict, meaning don't go talk to them. Don't tell them what's going on. Don't tell them your thoughts on the case, Morris or uh, Commissar or um, Raspbaum. Don't even talk to them. Take all your handwritten notes out, all your theories, anybody you talk to, pull it all out. We don't want the conflict seeping into any other lawyer. It seems like he's not saying there was any, you know, uh, intentional wrongdoing on the part of Morris or Commissar at all. At all, at all. He's just saying appearance of impropriety, better safe than sorry. You guys are out, transfer it, and don't even talk to the person you transfer, which is another reason why you don't want to give it to your buddy because it's more likely you talk to them or give them a hint about the case or tell them where you were going with the case. And that's really what we want to avoid. So yes, it is uh, Laurel, who I went to college with, or uh, law school with. Let me see if she's on Ufferman's. Um, it just has Ufferman's resume. Yeah, it just has Ufferman's resume, but... Um, it does say that she works there now. Yeah, let's just let's take a look at her uh, Florida bar. Let's give her a little shout here. A law school buddy here. This is Laurel Cornell Niles. Um, Leon County admitted 9-23-2013, same as me. Florida State College of Law, year, graduation class 2013, same as me. Appellate practice, criminal law, works at Michael Ufferman Law Firm, uh, firm size two to five lawyers. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, it like froze me when I saw that. Um, but that was cool. Let me see one other thing here before we go. All right. Yeah, I, wanted, I was going to check one more thing, but okay. So let me know what you guys think. 
Do you think this was fair by the judge? Do you think it was a good idea? Do you think it's going to end up he helping Don Adelson at the end? Are you surprised Charlie Adelson and his lawyer are doing these things that are very obviously bad for Don Adelson? Can't wait to read your comments, but this trial is not happening anytime soon. Please hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. I don't know when I'm going to be posting videos at all this week because of the hurricane. I wanted to record some to be able to play later for you guys to enjoy and interact with, and we could be able to hang a little bit. Um, but that's all we got for this one. Until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.